The quagga was a zebra-like animal that was hunted to extinction in 1883. And I've been looking for the remains of a very specific one, and I think I've found it. I think it's one of these quaggas here in Mainz, Germany. Believe it or not, this quagga has played a big role in science and even in our understanding of human evolution. In 1984, scientists successfully extracted DNA from the preserved muscle tissue of a quagga from Mainz, one of those quaggas. They were able to discover that the quagga and the zebra last shared a common ancestor about three to four million years ago. But much more importantly, they discovered for the first time that ancient DNA could be preserved in tissue long after an animal had died. And just like that, the age of ancient DNA was upon us. Since then, ancient DNA has become one of the most important tools we have in understanding human evolution, revealing entirely new branches of our evolutionary tree and tying us intimately to our closest cousins. Shout out Neanderthals. It truly was a scientific revolution. There's no two ways about it. Today though, I want to discuss the next step in that revolution, getting DNA from dirt. This whole branch of genetics is called sedimentary ancient DNA, or SEDA DNA for short. And there was one thing I really wanted to know first. Where does this genetic material come from? Questions I wrote to you, I asked, is it poo slash we? Or someone <laughs> <laughs> walking past, you know, is it like tiny microscopic fossils? Where, what's, where's this DNA coming from? I think it's probably a combination of both. That's Elena Zavala, an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen and sedimentary ancient DNA expert. She was one of the geneticists behind a very high profile study into Denisova Cave. I mean, we do see evidence um, that when you have places at higher occupation, there's more DNA from an individual or from a, a group. So for example, in, again, if we go back to Denisova Cave, there are relatively few skeletal remains from hyenas in Denisova Cave in certain subsets, but you know it was basically occupied by hyenas. So they were living, eating, defecating, everything in this cave. But of course, if you have a, a body that's there, uh, a carcass, its uh, fluids are also oozing into the sediment too, and it's probably coming from that as well. And there's also a certain times when, um, where we have a lot of samples in a single line or a single row. And in general, we would say, okay, the predominant signal is from these taxa, but then you'll get this one sample that has a ton of mammoth DNA or a ton of rhinoceros DNA. And the thought from that is that it probably is a teeny little bone shard or something that's in there. And that's what's driving that sample. We don't know for sure. All of these sources, pee, poo, body ooze, broken bones, it all contributes to the genetic information in the soil. To understand why these ancient Neanderthal pissoirs are so important, so exciting, we have to understand the limitations of getting DNA from a skeleton. And obviously, the biggest disadvantage is that skeletons are very, very rare. One, you don't always find skeletal remains, right? And even if you do find them, you may only find a handful. I mean, even if you look at the Denise McCabe study, for example, we have around 200,000 years of occupation and 15 individuals to try and put in there. <laughs> and mm. it's very hard to make kind of big general conclusions about that with such a small data size. Now, DNA does have an advantage in that when you're studying my DNA, you're also studying the DNA of my parents and my grandparents and, and so on and so on. You can get an idea of the, the size of the community I live in. It is a very powerful tool, it's a very good tool. But nevertheless, a small sample size is a small sample size and science thrives on data. So data hungry all the time, the more the better. And this is the big advantage of sedimentary DNA. There's a lot of it. There's really a lot of it. That allows for a lot more uh, density in sampling and ideally more continuous context for any types of occupation or being able to detect it. I have some savings goals that are really important to me, maybe connected to the future of the channel and some cool video ideas. And I really want to be on top of my finances this year, which is where Rocket Money comes in. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that allows you to manage subscriptions, create a custom budget, lower your bills, and save more money all in one place. I love using Rocket Money for the budgets, the budgeting. I have to, 
It's just one of those things. You have to look at your money. You have to keep on top of it. Rocket Money can also automatically scan your bills to try and save you money, get you a better deal. And very famously, of course, you can cancel your subscriptions. It shows you all your subscriptions in one place with the push of a couple of buttons you can cancel them. I cannot tell you how much of the stress that I felt for the past couple of years just came from uncertainty around money. And just staying on top of it helps so much with your goals and just uh, peace of mind, man. Peace of mind. Take control of your money today. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash Stefan Milo to get started for free. Check out this picture of one of the walls in Denisova Cave. This is the southeast wall of the main chamber. As you can see, they've dug down really far, at least three meters, maybe four. And if you look at Elena's paper, each of the white dots represents a soil sample taken for genetic analysis. You can get a genetic profile of the entire occupation of the cave through time, not just one specific point when one specific person was alive. This, of course, allows you to see how the occupation changes over time. And so, again, for example, in Denise River Cave here, where one of the areas I thought was interesting is we have this period where below and above it, we had Denisovan DNA that we found, but then there's this time set that we only found Neanderthal DNA. From roughly 90,000 to 120,000 years ago, only Neanderthal DNA is detected at the cave. No Denisovans at all. It's illustrated in these illustrations here. Blue is the Neanderthal presence, red Denisovan, and there's this gap of red right here. You could hypothetically also come to this conclusion from skeletal remains, but when you have so few samples, it's just it's just so hard to know, right? And if mm. you only had one skeletal remain, that's not really a lot of evidence to show there weren't Denisovans there. But then when you have dozens of samples across different chambers of sediment DNA that only has Neanderthal and there's no evidence of Denisovan, it's still not a guarantee, but it, a lot it's a lot stronger evidence to say and that potentially this lack of evidence is maybe evidence of absence, which is hard to say otherwise. The other big advantage, of course, is that you are not just getting human DNA. You're getting DNA from everything else that was peeing, pooing, and oozing. <laughs> this time period where Neanderthals appear on the scene and Denisovans leave seemingly coincides with a, a bit of a cold snap. And with this change in climate comes change in the animals in the area too, particularly bears and hyenas seem to change. And then here you can also see this change in that we saw with the uh, bears from predominantly cave bears in the lower layers to brown bears in upper layers, and then the types of hyena mitochondrial DNA that we found and how that correlates to this climatic change in the region. It can't really be overstated how much this ability to get a cross section through time of an entire occupation of a cave, of a region, could be an absolute game changer. We'll really be able to sort of start to truly untangle this complicated web of movement, human and animal movement and migration and evolution through time, regardless of the, the presence or absence of fossils. It's an absolute game changer. It's an absolute game changer. Okay, I know this is a, a slight aside, but there's this really interesting paper I want to highlight just to show the potential. This is one of the first sort of papers that sort of drew my attention to sedimentary ancient DNA or, or environmental DNA, you could think of this as as well. Collapse of the Mammoth Steppe in Central Yukon is revealed by ancient environmental DNA. So this study was tracking environmental changes in the Yukon region of Canada using DNA from cores. They found that the decline of the Mammoth Steppe after the last glacial maximum coincided with the decline of the mammoths. Very interesting. But incredibly, they detected horse and mammoth DNA as recently as 5,700 years ago. Basically like 7,000 years after it was believed they had died out everywhere but Wrangell Island. The authors hypothesized that these high altitude regions of Canada may have served as refugia for the animals too. Almost like uh, in a similar way to Wrangell Island, basically. Sort of islands then that aren't islands to use Atlas Pro's term. Pretty crazy to imagine mammoths and horses alive in the Americas as recently as 5,000 years ago, potentially. Not on some isolated island, but really on the mainland. What potential this has to really illuminate prehistory. 
it's going to be big. It's, it's going to be really, really big. We're on the cusp of this stuff being huge. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Stefan, how can we be sure that something as small as DNA or ooze or microfossils hasn't moved, hasn't moved in the sediment? Well, for example, in that particular study of mammoths, they found that mammoth signal in three out of four sites and in nine core samples. So it wasn't just a one-off. Um, but you're right. You're right. That is basically the big dilemma. Yes, that's always it's still a, a hot topic of conversation of how do we, how do we know <laughs> is where we think it's from. There's no shortcut here. There's no shortcut at all. The only way your results can be shown to be reliable is by doing lots and lots of work, analyzing the excavation in, in as many ways as possible. But um, you want to have as much contextual information as possible so that you can have confidence in your results. It's also why it's really, really important to collaborate with geochronologists, micromorphologists, other people who understand what's going on with the sediments as a whole. Is there evidence of bioturbation? Is there burrowing? Is there some small mammal that has burrowed down to all the different layers and is mixing up all the signal when it does that? Uh, we have to know all that information before we're you know, staking big claims on some of these results. When you have all of this data, all of this information, you can kind of start to see if anything is seems out of place. There's a great example, actually, of this challenge from Elena's study in Denisova Cave. So this is a, a diagram of one of the walls. You can see here blue, red, and yellow dots, all kind of close together. These represent genetic signals from Neanderthals and Denisovans and modern humans, all from basically the same layer. That's obviously extremely, extremely interesting because we know we interbred with them. We had to have done that at a location at some point. So you can't help but think, was it here in Denisova Cave? That particular layer of Earth was sometimes jokingly referred to as the party layer, I believe, by some of the team there. But here's the issue, these dotted lines. This layer is not clearly defined, and we just cannot be sure that it hasn't been disturbed. You can kind of see it in this picture of the site too. That particular spot, it just doesn't have as clear and obvious layers as, as other areas. It's the main limit of sedimentary DNA. It's the sediment itself. If we can't be sure about the condition of the layers, condition of the earth, we can't be sure about the results. Or we're still getting the results, I suppose, but we can't be sure about their chronology, how it all ties together. It's the dirt. The other big challenge is that collecting so many samples is just an enormous amount of work. Well, it's, when you have that many, it takes, it takes time to run. I mean, the samples for that study it took me two years to generate all of that data. And that was with automation. Huge shout out to Elena and everyone else for working on these questions for literally years. You see the interesting results, the paper comes out, the articles are written, the YouTube videos are made. It seems so sudden, doesn't it? Everything is breaking discovery, but wow. It's really years and years of people's lives are spent on these questions. I hope at the minute I've shown the enormous potential for, for said DNA to untangle human evolution on a, on a really huge scale, on a broad scale like we've never really perhaps been able to do before. But these technologies can also tell incredibly personal and incredibly human stories too. You were able to extract human DNA from an actual artifact. Yeah, it's, it is crazy. This is a pendant made from a deer tooth in the ground at Denisova Cave. Geneticist Elena Essel had been working for years on a technique to extract DNA from artifacts. And Elena Zavala was working on that project too, was also involved in that study. Yes, there's two geneticists called Elena on this project. Sorry for the confusion. I also have an auntie Elena, but as far as I'm aware, she uh, is, was not involved. The DNA extracted from this pendant suggested it belonged to a woman who lived about 19 to 25,000 years ago and belonged to haplogroup U. I really wanted to ask Elena, how could we be sure that the DNA actually came from that pendant and not somewhere else, some other source? Oh, yeah, so that was, of course, one of our first questions of, you know, is it DNA leaching in or how confident are we that it's actually from the pendant itself? And this is where it was so lucky that our colleagues uh, and collaborators uh, from Denise of a Cave, they actually, when they found this pendant, 
Um, so when we were working on the Denise McKay sediment project, actually they're bringing more samples. They're like, oh, while we were you know, excavating, we found this pendant. It's still in the soil. We put it straight in a bag and, you know, what do you think we can do with it? So Elena Essel basically devised this method to put the artifact through multiple washes of solutions that continued to extract DNA. And with each wash, the results were further and further refined. And what was great about that is that we could have these kind of fractionized extractions of DNA, these multiple washes and cleaning to see what does the DNA look like as we add extra and extra washes. And when you do that, um, first from the faunal side, you see that the initial extractions are tons of different types of fauna in there. And it looks very much like the sediment samples that I have from Denise Buck Cave. And on the human side, too, you see that there's evidence of multiple different types of mitochondria, for example. Um, and then as you're going through these washes, all of the other, on the faunal side, the other types of mitochondrial DNA disappear and you're left only with deer. And that makes sense because you have a deer pendant. Mm. And so now we feel confident, okay, it's coming from the actual pendant. This is now the DNA of the pendant that we are recovering in terms of that server, that deer tooth. And at the human side, we also now see the appearance of one mitochondrial DNA type. And this also gives us this confidence that this is actually somebody who handled and touched this pendant 20,000 years ago. And it's not just leaching in from the sediment itself. It's kind of mind blowing because someone that lived 20,000 years ago, this is almost like the closest we can get to know them. Do you know what I mean? We'll never know their name. We'll never know even what language they spoke or what they laughed at or their favorite food or anything. We'll know no personal details about them. This is almost like this mitochondrial DNA. It's almost like that only from an artifact that they presumably used in war. It's like the closest we can get to know them in a way. Do you feel that way? I don't know. It seems mind blowing to me. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's really, it's really crazy. And it was actually also like crazy for me from a, somebody who works in ancient DMA, actually how much DNA we got out that I was able to perform nuclear analysis on it. And at the same time, in parallel that I was working on this project, I was working on another project where we had uh, an infant burial um, for around 30,000 years ago. And the DNA from these teeth that I was working on was actually worse than the DNA that we recovered from this pendant. Wow. It was just so in incredible. It really feels like we're on the cusp of a, of a really incredible new world when it comes to the study of human origins. Like hypothetically in the future, let's imagine we find a new site. If we're lucky enough to get human remains from it, we can extract DNA from them. See how these individuals fitted into our tree and you know how big was the community that they lived in and all of these things. We can get DNA from the soil to show how these populations changed over time and the environment changed along with them. And in some cases, we'll be able to literally extract DNA from the artifacts they left behind themselves. See who wore them, handled them, made them. It's like the DNA of touch, of human touch. It's so personal. It's so incredible. It really is the next frontier in ancient DNA. It's incredible. It's incredible stuff. I hope you find it interesting. I'm very excited about it.